Obadiah is an amazing prophet, a very short book in the Bible, 21 verses. We're going to study that in three minutes. It's a good day to read the Bible. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery as we discover the Word of God. Now, the 66 books written by the 40 authors over 1,500 years is very important. We're going to study that in a moment. In about 15 minutes, Corey and Ryan are coming. Corey? Well, today I'm going to be taking a look at Edom because that was Obadiah's whole focus. Ryan? Well, today I'm actually going to be spotlighting one of my YouTube videos here on the show. And I call this segment The Rundown because it's all about Jonah's attempted escape from God, which we're going to read about on tomorrow's program. It's very good. I look forward to that. Okay. What are we doing? Well, hooray. It's our Friday wrap-up question, and I'm going to pose a question, and it can be anywhere from Hosea chapter 5 through to Obadiah. All right, take your Bible guide, turn to Obadiah. Let's learn what God said. Obadiah 1 through 9. The Vision of Obadiah Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, and let us rise up against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be greatly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high. You who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you ascend as high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. If thieves had come to you, if robbers by night, oh, how you will be cut off, would they not have stolen till they had enough? If grape gatherers had come to you, would they not have left some gleanings? Oh, how Esau shall be searched out, how his hidden treasures shall be sought after. All the men in your confederacy shall force you to the border. The men at peace with you shall deceive you and prevail against you. Those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you. No one is aware of it. Will I not in that day, says the Lord, even destroy the wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountains of Esau? Then your mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that everyone from the mountains of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. Obadiah verses 1 through 9. Worshipper of Yahweh, that's the Hebrew word for the name of God. Worshipper of Yahweh, Obadiah, that's what it means. This is a very fascinating passage of scripture and it's only 21 verses long. We're gonna focus on the first part of this here, but it's important to remember that Obadiah's Hebrew name, which means worshiper of God, it's important for us to remember that because this minor prophet is not minor because of what he says, but because of the volume of his writing. In other words, the amount of verses only 21, because the book of Obadiah consists of 21 verses, focusing exclusively on the nation of Edom. Remember the Edomites, they were the descendants of Esau. Even before they were born, twins, Jacob and Esau, they were battling in the womb. Esau was the first of the twins to be born. But later in life, the brother Jacob stole away his birthright. And the rivalry between the brothers was intense. In the end, they came back together, but their descendants, the Israelites and the Edomites, they didn't make peace. After the Israelites came out of the land of Egypt, the Edomites did not help them. In fact, they wanted Israel destroyed. Now, Obadiah is called to pronounce God's punishment on the people who at the best times ignored Israel, but at other times purposely troubled her. Obadiah is the prophet who's going to speak against them now. Isn't that interesting? Well, take your Bible guide if you have one and turn to today's passage. This is important. If you don't have a Bible guide, 
you can call us or write to us. We'll send you one. Just remember that it cost us a little bit of money to send it to you. Uh, but also you can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. BibleDiscoveryTV.com is a website where you can click on the Bible guide. It, it takes you there. And thank you for your donations. It'll take you to a place where you can download it exactly how we printed it. But we need to pray. Father, today I ask that as we focus on this, there are struggles in our lives. Struggles that the Holy Spirit will help us to, to deal with. But Lord, we have to come to grips with that. And so, Father, we pray that you would show us your way and teach us your path, that the visions of the Obadiah, of course, are for the Edomites. But Lord, so many people, we need to hear these messages because they speak to us. So thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And we said together, amen. So in this short passage, let's begin by reading verse one. The vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, and let us rise up against her for battle. Verse 2. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be greatly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, you who, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you ascend as high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. First point, God confronts the Edomites in their pride, the pride of where they, where and how they live. There is no nation. There is no culture out of God's reach. I'll say that again because it's important to us. There is no place, no nature where God's, God cannot see. I find it interesting that in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, they hid behind a bush. What's that about? God made the bush. I mean, God can't see behind it. Of course he can. God was asking the questions to get them to confess to what they had done. Very important. But there is no nation where God cannot see. He sees every terrorist. He sees everything going on right now. The motivations of every person. God knows that. Obadiah continues. This is really, really important. Here is what he says. He says, if thieves had come to you, if robbers by night, oh, how would you be cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If grape gatherers had come to you, would they not have left some gleanings? Oh, how Esau shall be searched out, how his hidden treasures shall be sought after. All the men in your confederacy shall force you to the border. The men of peace with you shall deceive you and prevail against you. Those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you. No one is aware of it. In their pride, Edom will be unaware of their destruction. In their pride, Edom will be unaware of their destruction. Pride comes before a fall. And it always, it's always wrong way to think and live. Let me tell you. Pride comes before destruction and haughty spirit before. Whenever we start believing in we're so great, we got the Air Force, we got this. Whenever we start believing that, we need to back off because God is greater. God is bigger. God is more powerful, beloved. We need to understand that. We need to come to God. It's God who makes nations great and it's God who makes us good. And we need to come to Jesus Christ to confess our sins because that's the only way to really, really deal with sin. Well, this is interesting. The last two verses, he says here, will I not in that day, says the Lord, even destroy the wise men, the wise men from Edom and the understanding from the mountains of Esau. Then your mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed. 
to the end of everyone from the mountains of Esau, they may be cut off by slaughter. Third point, Edom will come to utter destruction because of how they treated Israel. Remember this, the Bible tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and for the peace of Israel. I'm telling you, you say, well, where does it say that rod? It says it in Psalm 122. I want to read it to you because it's very, very important because we need to pay attention to this. And this is something we need to focus on today because as we do this, God will reward us. Psalm 122 says this, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together where the tribes go up and the tribes of the Lord to the testimony of Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord for thrones are set there for judgment. The thrones of the house of David pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Verse six, may they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces for the sake of my brethren and for the companions. I will now say peace be within you because of the house of the Lord, our God, I will seek your good. Right there in the Bible, Psalm 122. That's a command from God. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the peace of Israel. Father, we pray for the peace of Israel. Bring peace there, because you're coming back there soon. All right, so today's assigned reading is Obadiah, but I'm going to jump ahead to Saturday's reading, which is Jonah. And I want to focus specifically on Jonah's attempted escape from the Lord, because there's something here that I don't want to miss. And the author, who may very well be Jonah himself, doesn't want his readers to miss it either. And when you pay very close attention, you'll notice he gives us some textual clues using key words. There's a critical life lesson to be learned through Jonah's experience. Check it out. Hi friends, I'm Ryan Hembry, and today I wanna to talk about the biblical prophet Jonah and his attempted escape from God. So grab your Bibles and let's go. Okay, so the book of Jonah, while it's very short and to the point, is both action-packed and full of important life lessons. It opens with these words. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So Jonah, for reasons he explains later, disobeys God's command by running away to Tarshish, which was in the completely opposite direction. He was running away from God. And notice the key words in this passage, because at every stage on his journey away from God, Jonah goes downward. The literal Hebrew says that he went down to the port of Joppa, then he went down to the ship, then he went down into the hold of the ship, where he fell into a deep sleep. So in a literal, metaphorical, and spiritual sense, Jonah went down as far as he could go. But he was about to be brought down even lower, because God sent a mighty storm that was so bad, Jonah ended up going overboard. And listen to the language Jonah uses to describe his descent into the deep. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. The water surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. The weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. So Jonah went down, down, down until he couldn't go down any further. 
This key word is a clue that the author is trying to teach us something through these very real events. And I think his point is crystal clear. And it's this, the more we separate ourselves from God, the giver and sustainer of life, the closer we get to death, both physical and spiritual. Notice that as Jonah descends closer and closer to physical death, Jonah pictures himself, his soul, as being imprisoned in Sheol, the realm of the dead. But when Jonah turns his life back over to God, God reverses Jonah's descent. In Jonah's own words, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. I went down to the moorings of the mountains, the earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. God rescued the repentant Jonah from death by way of a great fish. And just like Jonah, without God, we too are dead in the water. But when we turn to him, he saves us from death and raises us up by way of Jesus Christ. So one of the main lessons that we learn from the book of Jonah is that a life lived apart from God is a path to death because he is the giver and sustainer of life. This is a very common theme throughout the Bible. But when we repent, humble ourselves and turn to God, he saves us from death through Jesus Christ. Believe on him and you will be saved. You know, this is really interesting because Jonah is a fascinating character. We're going to talk about him. We won't talk about him on the air, but he's, we talk about him in the Bible Guide tomorrow. And uh, it is really interesting to see his attitudes and everything, how they reflect. He was a hard mm -hmm. man, but a very interesting guy, a great man. We'll talk to him when we get to heaven. Mm -hmm. Okay, Corey, you're up. All right. Well, Edom today. So when we're talking about the history of the nation of Edom, there is a lot of debate. And mainly because the data that it's available to historians and archaeologists is pretty fragmentary. And without written records of the Edomites, it's largely left up to interpretation. Now, from enemy records, we do know some things where Edom was, and from Assyrian records, we know Edomite kings paid tribute to Assyria during the time of the Assyrian Empire. But the Bible tells us a lot more. We know the origin of Edom, and we know the names of chiefs and kings of Edom that are given in the book of First Chronicles. We know that on Israel's way to the Promised Land, Edom refused them passageway through Edomite territory. We know that the Israelites often campaigned against Edom and took territory away from them. For example, Saul in 1 Samuel 14. Also, Doeg the Edomite, he worked for Saul and slaughtered the priests of Nob, which is not a glowing report on the faithfulness of Edomites. Now, sure, there would be hard feelings on that one for a very long time. We also know that David took Edomite territory in 2 Samuel 8. We know that they were completely subjected to Judah during Jehoshaphat's reign. You can see that in 1 Kings 22. But this was lost when Jehoshaphat's son Jehoram became king. Uh, Edom actually rebelled against Judah then and set up their own king once again. Now, when Jehoram went to war to get uh, Edom back, he almost lost his life in an ambush. He did make it back home safely, but he was in full military retreat and Edom was free once again, at least from Judah and for a time. Because in 2 Kings 14, we're told that the son of Joash, remember Joash, the boy king who was saved from Queen Athaliah's murderous rampage and then reestablished as king by the high priest Jehoiada, it was that Joash. Uh, his son named Amaziah launched a successful military battle against Edom. He's said to have defeated 10,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt and captured Selah in battle where he may or may not have thrown thousands of Edomites off its rocky cliffs to an untimely death. But he renamed Sila Jokthiel, which means subdued by God. More on Sila a bit later. But these victories made that king cocky, and he challenged the king of Israel, who promptly destroyed the wall of Jerusalem, raided the temple, and took hostages back to Israel. Second Chronicles 25 fills in some of the details for us. Apparently on uh, taking the gods of Edom as spoils of war, Amaziah set them up to be worshiped. 
A common practice was to pay tribute to the gods of a conquered people so as to earn that god's patronage rather than inspire their wrath. But this led to an awful confrontation with a prophet of God and Amaziah's pride was on full display, not even allowing the prophet to fully give the message of God. Later in the days of King Ahaz of Judah, the time of Isaiah the prophet, the time when Assyria was empire building, we're told in 2 Chronicles 28 that Ahaz reached out to Assyria for aid because he was dealing with raids from Aram and Israel to the north and raids from the Edomites from the south. So Edom, this relationship that was really tumultuous, it does not fare well in the prophetic books of the Old Testament. In various ways, Edom is condemned and spoken against in Isaiah. He's spoken against in Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, and Malachi. Now, there are a few things Edom is accused of, but especially of taking possession of Judah's land and being opportunistic in Judah's weakness and or her day of disaster. Now, archaeologically, not a lot is known of Edom, again, because there aren't written records coming from her. There have been a couple of temple or cultic sites unearthed from southern Judah showing that Edom did indeed conquer up into Judah, and large-scale copper productions dating back to before the time of King David have also been explored, yielding really interesting results that may give evidence to a centralized government, perhaps taking over from what was at first an Egyptian-controlled industry. But for our purposes today, in speaking about the destruction of Edom and that famous or maybe infamous site of Selah where Amaziah threw Edomite men off of some sort of cliff, the site of S. Selah today is still unexcavated, but it gathered a lot of attention in the early 2000s because the site is a natural rock fortress with towering walls accessible only through a narrow ancient staircase. Now, from finds on the surface of the fortress, it was occupied in the biblical Iron Age and could have been a good place to throw a bunch of people from. But it gained attention for the Escila Relief, a plaque carved into a cliff face that had a depiction of Babylonian King Nabonidus and accompanied with writing that it is mostly indecipherable today. But the carving demonstrates what historians have believed about the destruction of Edom for years uh, that was learned from four surviving Babylonian records that Edom fell to Babylon during Nabonidus' com campaign through their region on his way to a desert oasis where he oddly chose to live for 10 years while his son Belshazzar acted as co-regent back in Babylon. Yeah, th this is really something because as we focus on this, uh, the, the Edomites were people that uh, didn't really f fare well with the Israelites or the Judeanites uh, or the Judites. Yeah, the Judeans. Uh, and the important part of this to remember is that God pays attention to how we treat the people, his people. And that's important today as well. But, but that is really interesting. There's a lot of material that has emerged now. Yeah, we, we really see in the Bible this, this history of infighting between people who are supposed to be relatives. They're supposed to be at peace. But like Edom was very, very opportunistic whenever it would see Judah in distress, it yeah. would raid up in, into her territory and take that territory. And so there is evidence of that on the southern border of Judah. Um, and, and like we said, because there's no written records coming from Edom herself, it's pretty difficult. But that the Babylonian inscription right on the walls of Asoa is really, really interesting. It's tantalizing for sure to label that as the place yeah, a big, uh, a where big... Amaziah part of Edom was in modern day Jordan. Yeah. And so that's really interesting as we focus on that because all of a sudden the activity around Israel now, everybody's paying attention to it, but it's, it's war and there's bombs going off and things happening. And the archeologists are very nervous and jittery because these bombs are destroying things. Yeah, you know, war is never good for historical research. It's just one of those things, even like even installing archeological excavations or outright stopping them for a really long time, it's brutal. And I mean, that's not the, the main brutality of war, obviously. So I don't wanna emphasize that too much, but it definitely is a factor that, yeah. that is really unfortunate. Very interesting. Thank you, Corey. Uh, okay.
You're well, up. we switch now <laughs> to our question, anywhere from Hosea chapter 5 through to Obadiah. All right. It's actually a very short question. Are okay. You ready? All that right. could be good or bad. Yes. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yes. We'll see. Yeah. Here it goes. <laughs> Amos was a sheep breeder from where? Where was Amos from? Tekoa, Teman, or Tarsus? Hmm. That's that's easy. Words. I, I, I'm not going to say anything because every time I say something, I get, you know, but anyway, <laughs> what do you guys think? Amos was a sheep breeder from where? Yeah, this is a this is a good question. Um, we're going to go with Tekoa. Yes, with Tekoa. All right. Well, if you went with Tekoa as well, let's see if you're right. Amos 1 verse 1 says, the words of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So if you guessed Tekoa, you're absolutely right. Good for you. Yes, and, and I want to say that uh, also that if you're working on this, we have a, a new, um, it's a quiz, and we put it on the internet. It is really cool. Rachel's put it together and it's awesome. It's a Bible IQ question. Bible IQ question yes. quiz. Yeah. Yes. So check it out at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And I think we have it a few more places too. But anyway, it's all part of our regular feeding of learning from God's word. So remember the quiz. Lord, today we pray, and I ask that you would help me make my reactions according to your Holy Spirit. You know, that's really important, Lord, because sometimes I react wrongly, especially on the road. Somebody cuts me off. Help my reactions to be good and help me, Lord, to be right with you in Jesus' name. Father, also be with the people who support this ministry and help us touch them and help them today. In the name of Jesus Christ, we said together, amen.